Greetings. So here we go. I'm going to do the little bit where I try and find the right screen. Yes. Okay. So this is our little presentation. I hope you can see it okay. And as I've just said, um, this is a resource also for you to use through this year and through the coming months. Um, I've deliberately made it quite basic, otherwise we'd be here all day. Um, I'm gonna talk about this later, but non-dual astrology is a really amazing thing. And I feel it's a key to coming into a higher timeline. And uh, there's a little bit of a predicament in starting to present that to people because different people know different systems or they're new to astrology. So currently my endeavor is to try to start to lay the foundations for people to start to understand what they need to understand. The last two years, I did do a non-dual astrology presentation and I gave a big discussion about what is non-dual astrology. And I really want to get into astrology today. And especially because we've got Chrissy here. Christy works with Western astrology. So I'll probably ask her for a little bit of insight as well, because it's really, there are so many things going on with non-dual astrology in that if we want to go through a consciousness shift, if we've got a bunch of astrologers who are the people who are working with space and time dynamics and karma, and they can't all even sit in a room together to discuss how we can go beyond one system, how are we ever gonna go to another timeline? Okay, so that's currently my work is uh, actually getting the global astrology community online and, you are the first people to hear about this before it gets properly um, promoted. And in, in April, on the 1st of April, we're going to begin a global endeavor of non-dual astrology symposiums. That's going to be a kind of 10 year countdown to when the llamas feel we have the conditions for a golden age. And so if we start to dance with time, and get astrologers to get, you know, get them in a boxing ring or whatever they need to do, then that's a really helpful thing. And I'm not gonna go into it too much, but we've had really good signs about offering this. So, um, so I am saying that to you because we do have resources available. If you're, if you're like, this is speaking to me, but I don't really understand it. This is the endeavor, is that we're going to start laying it out in a basic way with key uh, vanguards in their respective lineage of astrology. And we're gonna be beginning with the, the traditional Mayan calendar and the galactic Mayan calendar on the 1st and the 8th of April this year. And I'd actually been sitting with it all for quite a while uh, and I couldn't, it, something wasn't fitting. And then I suddenly really realized it was about the audience. It was like, if we, if we, if we introduce four systems to them in, in over two weekends, nobody's gonna have a clue unless they're an astrologer. So we're going to actually start with the galactic Mayan and the traditional Mayan. And, and, and I want you to know that because um, most of you have a bit of an awareness about those two systems. So we'll be talking a bit about those today. We're also going to be talking about Vedic astrology, tiny references to Western astrology. But the idea is that over the next 10 years, we're going to be helping people actually learn through these symposiums about some of the salient points of each tradition and actually what happens when you read them together and for me um I guess I'm at, at this point now in my life you know we all go through energy changes and I'm more and more of a hermit and I've always loved astrology but for me it never I got it but it never clicked to be learning western astrology so I you know I'm an enthusiast but the dream spell and the traditional man calendar I've you know I've got a big connection with Mexico and I've worked a lot with time and sacred sites here and then Vedic astrology came into my life just like less than two and a half years ago properly like you can't ignore me and it clicks there's something from a past life that's and it's in my chart it's like yeah you work with this okay so I'm now in a very very deep state of inquiry and I'm um, lucky to be learning with amazing astrologers and so um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about non-dual astrology, but in a very basic way today, because I'm just going to ask you to throw away all the kind of trying to work it out stuff and know that if you want to work it out, we're here to teach you it and it's starting really soon. Okay, so just let the transmission um, 
roll over you today. This is going to be a transmission state sort of work. Let your body and your being land with this weaving of time. What I'm finding when I'm giving readings is that there's this zero pointing of sorts that goes on when you can see correlations in systems that people say don't have anything in common. And I think so many people know that they're coming up to a higher timeline. They really want to know what their dharma is. And, and, and I feel like this is my service. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm so excited, you know, and I love doing this. So it's with great pleasure that I present this today. And, you know, I have limitations and shortcomings. I'm still a baby. I'm still a student. I will always be a student as I'm in a body. Yeah. Because these systems are so vast, especially Vedic, Vedic astrology, Jyotish that I'm studying, but you could look at Western astrology and say the same. So, um, so we're going to give an overview. But Linda, can you let Maria in, please? Thanks. Um, so we're going to um, really see that throws me off. So people can just press the button. I get I go off my channel. So, um, so yeah. So today I'm going to just talk about some really simple principles, and I'm going to be talking about some of these principles again in a February transmission because I'm also going to do a February transmission about the next ten years. And of course, the universe is always expanding and contracting and our karma changes, we work through things. I cannot give you, I cannot be like, I am the prophet and it's all going to be like this. But I can tell you some energetics to look out for so that we can really get our eyes on the prize of what might be coming and, and how that may be working on the singular and the collective. So, uh, so today I will talk a little bit about the year Lord energy. And that's something I'm going to be really referring to in this weaving that I give uh, very soon in February, because uh, it's, it, it's, it's really simple ways that are very basic, that even if you're not an astrologer, you can start to look at general themes. And even having that much connection to space and time to know general themes is better than being stuck in Gregorian no man's land, in weird systems with nothing to do with natural law or natural time. What we're saying when we do that, when we are not dancing with time, we're a slave to it. And part of this coming into the golden age is, us to create, is for us to create these conditions that shall we weave and we dance with time. And the universe lets us cancel our karma and it gives us very fast track growth. And that's why I think so many people are coming online and wanting readings and wanting the zero point. And finally, I just really want to, before I really introduce what we're going to do, I, I really want to give gratitude to traditional owners, ancestors and ancients of the land I'm in and the lands we're in. I'm in Mexico. So I'm here sitting in one of the, the, the seats of natural law, natural time. And I want to give gratitude to this sacred area because I'm actually sitting at the zero point. Uh, in an, a special area beside the Pleiades rocks. I can see them from my, my window. So um, I'm really asking for those celestial and energetic frequencies to be present today. And I want to call upon our higher selves, modern selves and avatar selves to be with us in the ever present now. And giving gratitude to the grandmothers, the net of light, this crystalline mycelium grade of consciousness the Shambhala Dharma Kings, keepers of the golden age timeline frequencies. And to ask us all to be able to receive the transmission in its transmission state today so that you can be aligned with natural law, natural time to help you find your right place in what could be quite an interesting year. I want to call upon the Rishis and the celestial bodies and ask them to channel wisdom throughout today. Uh, so that we can incarnate our highest possibilities at this time. I give gratitude to the day keepers of the Mayan lands, to Mark Elmi, my teacher in the traditional galactic Mayan, or the traditional Mayan system, to Jose Arguelles and all his people who brought through the dream spell calendar. And finally, I wanna give gratitude to Ganesha, the patron deity of Jyotish, the science of light, AKA Vedic astrology. And to do that, we connect with Ganesha mantra, which I'm gonna do nine times. Om Shrim Gangana Pataye Namaha, 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 Om Shrim Gangana Pataye Namaha.
Okay, so I'm going to give a very brief overview of what we're going to do today. A little bit of talking about non-dual astrology. And then I'm going to talk about the year lords, which we've mentioned. We're also going to just look at a few big planetary influences that are coming, coming very soon to you. And uh, yeah, big times that foot, some stuff that we've been really lining up for for quite a long time. I'm also going to talk about the karmic nodes and what they're doing and the dance that they're doing. Uh, and I will be referring to the karmic nodes as Rahu and Ketu, and I will probably explain a little bit about them there. If any of you want to request a little bit of um, a video about uh, Rahu and Ketu, can you message Madalena or even just message her in the chat box today um, and we can get that sent out to you. I have, and I also, anybody who's present on the call, you can request a non-dual astrology um, talk and the Rahu and Ketu talk. So you're actually able to go to baby school now if you want. Um, and no, don't worry about the facts too much today about the, the science and bits, okay? I'm gonna be talking about something of a magic spark that's coming for everybody this year, which has its light and it has its shadow. So we will be looking at that a little bit there. And then I'm going to be talking about the energies of each of these months um, up to and including April to give you a bit of a head start on the year. And, and then I'll talk about a few more energies to look out for in this year so that you can, can be, be ready, okay? And, and this is one of the reasons why particularly Jyotish Vedic astrology came through was that the rishis brought this system through because they wanted the yogis not to suffer. They wanted spiritual people to be at their optimum if we're always constantly a train, a train crash because we're being walloped by karma, what use are we to our communities? So within the science, there are so many detailed um, remedies and mantras and, and ways of, of basically meeting things head on, things that are ripened from lifetimes ago, and then we can just dance through it. And, and, and this is even the thing of if you know about something, if you have mindfulness of it, you're halfway there. This is the same of what is working through karma. And when we're really blended with past timelines, once we're aware of that, we start to heal. But if we're flailing around in this sea of wonky materialism and we don't have any reference points, that's when we suffer more. So this is part of the reason to give this transmission is so that you can have a bit of a heads up. And, and, and I know that we have these, um, sorry, these months that, sorry, let me just say, this is going funny. Okay. We have these months where everybody's like, oh, it's going to be a nightmare. And then you kind of see, you're like, oh yeah, well, that day was a bit challenging, but you're like, it's, it's you got ready, you know, like, oh, I'm not going to go out that day, or I'm not going to do something really crazy that day, things like that. So I hope that this equips you in that way. All right. So as I've mentioned, I'm not going to spend today confusing you by giving a really detailed explanation of the three major systems I'm going to be using today. But as I said earlier, there's something really magical happening when we triangulate, when we look at, I look at three systems currently in a close reading uh, and I'm, I'm getting really deep soul insights for people. Um, and having been an academic, when we're taught research methods, we're also taught that right, triangulation is a really, it's a, it's a stable way of doing academic inquiry and things like that. And it, it, it's probably worthwhile to say that the highest yoga tantra, which is also uh, the Kala Chakra, which is basically the system that Kentra Rinpoche is a teacher and master of this these are the people saying we can get the conditions for the golden age a second golden age to come by 2033 and their astrological system is triangulated it's vedic astrology chinese astrology and tibetan astrology so i believe we're on to something when we read uh, astrology together and you know that the buddhists are very into non-dual non-duality so i've been talking to rinpoche about this endeavor with non-dual astrology and um, in time, he has given me contacts of high lamas and um, astrologer lamas to, to contact, but I'm not going to talk to them just yet because we're on the Mayan systems right now. Okay. So basically, as I've said, we're here to suffer less. We're here to antidote karma. And 
I believe that, you know, we're in this quickening and this is why we have such information at our fingertips. We have wisdom keepers traveling from countries to come and give teachings. We have the digital possibilities of doing online classes with masters from all around the world. You know, I've received Pranayama teachings from 96 year old masters who are there in Mysore in India. You know, these things are, are amazing. And there's a quickening. And there's also, as, as we say, with a lot of the kids, and some of us are working with this, this endeavor, is that kids are coming through, and sometimes they're, they're coming with a lot of karma, uh, which means that they may seem uh, disabled, but they're not. They've got super abilities and magical abilities, but they're here to fast track. And it's almost like we have to clear a lot of our ancestral karma, the stuff that ripens for us, to create an energetic space and release a lot of density for them to suddenly come in with their multi-dimensional skills and perspectives. And this is going back to what the yogis have, you know, the high yogis and sages have these CDs. And, and truly, when we start to apply ourselves with things like pranayama and yoga and apply that to astrology and remedies to astrology, we're actually less encumbered by our karma and our dharma, our unique path starts to become clear. And also it's more likely for us to achieve these superpowers that help us do our dharma. The problem is that at the moment, a lot of people have dodgy CDs that are very much in the lower chakras and, and they're using manipulation and things like that because they haven't really done the work and they haven't usually done any work with their Saturn, the master of time and karma. So as I say, over these coming years, we're going to explain a lot more about the architecture of this and how this works, because the more you understand it, it's just a little computer game. And we, we, we won't get so emotionally stuck in our karma, because what happens is often we get very into self-cherishing and the pain body and poor me or the drama triangle. And we're kind of flailing around. And if we look at most of the planet's population right now who's stuck on social media and, and porn and Tinder, uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of flailing around in karma, yeah? But on the flip side, there's lots of people getting ready and lessening the load. Every day we're going through, we're clearing karma. So this truly a quickening, and we're going to start to see that over these coming years. And now, with what's coming this year, it's going to be a big year for shift. Okay, so I'll be mentioning the golden age, and um, as I've said, the lamas think that we have these possibilities of coming into a golden age, and there's already been another golden age, and what a golden age is, is a, an age where there's less suffering, there are more enlightened qualities, people are working through their karma, karma becomes less of a clutch, a hold on people, on a soul level, we're, we're clearing a lot, we're getting closer to liberation, and people are generally more kind and giving to each other. And this is also creating a kind of evolution for the species and, an, and, a, and a mass scale of development in many ways, okay? Now, we also have people talking about things like the age of Aquarius. And as I'm going to be describing, the age of Aquarius, some people would say we're entering it this year, but if you look at the, at the celestial bodies, we're not really. There's at least 300 years until we come from age of Pisces into age of Aquarius, which is interesting because if we, they usually say that a golden age will last about 500 years. It would be quite interesting because that would then be going crossing into Aquarius, yeah? And we have a lot of acceleration of things like technology, which usually are a sign that we are coming out of a Kali Yuga and we're in a gateway. There are different preparatory stages that lead us into the Satya Yuga. Um, now, in, in Vedic and Hindu astrology, people talk a lot about the Kali Yuga and different people believe we're in a different state in it, uh, depending on who you talk to. And if we were to just be looking at things like the astronomical qualities of Aquarius and the Kali Yuga and looking at time as a very finite thing, we're nowhere close, yeah? But um, the thing is that we have the possibilities to enter a new paradigm right now because of the influence of the celestial bodies. You see, our relationship to space and time and the celestial bodies is bound to karma. Time and karma are hand in hand. 
So the reality that we experience right now is very much about this day of the week, that's happening, my relationship to time, calm is ripening. But if we antidote things more, we don't really know if the time phases that were written of in ancient periods will still hold. You see, even our concept of time, people say the 24 hour clock is now down to less than 19 hours in a day, which is why people always wonder how they, you know, why is time feel like it's speeding up? So you see, it's all relative to actually karma, our reality. So whilst we can say, yes, the age of Aquarius is not in the sky yet. And we're, if we're looking at epochs in Vedic or Hindu cosmologies of when the, the Kali Yuga and the Satya Yuga are taking place, it's not correct. We're not nowhere, we're nowhere near. We don't know that because if we use the tools we've got now to quicken our healing of karma and our stepping into dharma, uh, our relationship to all the bodies in space and time will change. So we cannot say, and I cannot tell you, but um, what I can tell you is that very wise people say we have these conditions for at least a very deep state of progress to begin in 10 years, okay? And that we're in a countdown to that. So that's really why I'm here, to help us to dance with these systems, to try to find some meaning therein. And again, I just want to apologize in advance for my limitations, also the fact that I am making this a little bit basic, that each of you have your, your own personal astrology that's gonna affect this a little bit, and that, of course, there are way more experienced astrologers who probably give a way more sophisticated discussion of this than me. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to be dancing between the dream spell calendar, the galactic mind calendar, and the Vedic system. And obviously, okay, so in the, the planetary bodies in the Mayan systems, we look at cycles and natural law and natural time and gestation periods of things like the crops of corn and the body, Venus, the moon and the sun. And those are all written into those cycles, but we're not looking so much at what's Pluto doing or things like that in those systems. And the energy of the day and the energy of certain periods is really important. And we, we have 20 major signs and 13 tones in both of those systems. The dream spell calendar, for me, it's a more transpersonal, trans, transpersonal, slightly galactic energy of the way the signs work. The traditional mind calendar is a lot about our role in society, how that changes the role of our ancestors in our life, the effect of the mother line and the father line. So both of them are fulfilling something very distinct within our, our holistic sense of being. And the glyphs that are used in the dream spell calendar are an augmentation of the traditional systems um, glyphs. And therefore there's correlation. They're not always the same, but some of them remain very much the same. So every day we have a different energy and we go through cycles of those. And I will talk about that, it, you'll see in other transmissions. So we have days and years and things like that and cycles that are all pertinent to see what the energy of those days are. And that gives us an insight into how to be in the right space and the right time. Interestingly, in the Vedic system, the moon, there are these things called lunar nakshatras. They're actually the higher celestial bodies. They are higher than the planets. And these inform a lot upon the like kind of soul energetics, the emotions, the characteristics of people and things. And when we give readings of those uh, alongside our planets, we can get a very, very distinct sense of the flavor of someone and where they're at. And so actually it, there is a, a day energy also in, in Vedic astrology with there's a different nakshatra every day and that goes through cycles of 27. There are actually 28, but one of them remains a little bit secret because of misuse in the past. So we do have this sense of correlation within these three systems that there are energies of days. And when we start to understand the energies of the day and we start to live with that, we're able to go, you know what? I don't feel like doing that deadline today. I'm going to go swimming, yeah? And not feel guilty about it, not sit all day just staring at the wall and wasting the day. And then when we're using those energies right, we've got more time, more beauty time, more art time. Basically, when we do that, we go, I'm going to go swimming today. We wake up at 5 a.m. the next day and write the deadline within 30 minutes, you know, because it's like permaculture. When we're in natural law and time, we're utilizing the energies and we're, we're in correlation and a dance with them. 
we are actually having more seamless life and we don't push the Western world, the patriarchal world, is patriarchal world is all about pushing into the wrong space, the wrong territory, and it's a bit of a mess because people are not, they're not doing their dharma. Okay, so this presentation will be a lot about these key energies to help you to go, ah, oh, that energy is going to be coming that day. Or, this is a bit like this. Okay, I get it. Yeah. And I assure you that the more and more you go, I'm going to make, just look at that today. How do I start working with these systems? Would I start just looking at what's the energy of today? What's going on for me? And now I get, I go, oh, we're going to do something on this day and I'll look it up and it's exactly the right day because I've been embodying these, those systems for so long now that uh, my body aligns with it and I have more flow and I have nicer time. Okay. Okay. So. I'm going to talk first about the year lords because this is a very basic way at looking at kind of some general energetics that are going to be around okay and um yeah sorry I, I can't see part of my screen this is what happens when I go it's all your little faces okay yes yeah, so I just want to remember what's on the side of my screen okay so I'm going to start first with where we're at the galactic Mayan calendar and that's here we're in red, we're in self-existing red moon or red self-existing moon, okay? So it's interesting. Um, I'll talk about trauma here a little bit. I'm noticing more and more people saying, yeah, I want to get trauma-informed. I know I need to do that. And, you know, there's certain things sometimes when we're talking to our students about, we need to learn about this. Nobody wants to know. It's not exotic enough that year. And I'm seeing people want to know about trauma now. And the moon is about self-remembrance. And um, it's also about purification and working with the unconscious. It's also about the opening point to a cosmic state of being. It's not a fully multidimensional woo-woo sort of thing. It's an opening. It's an opening that's a gateway to a higher sense of being. It's an opening to being a beacon of consciousness. And through, through self-remembrance and clearing and purifying, we start to get a sense of who we are, okay? And so this year, up till 25th of July, um, and this started on the 26th of July last year, we, we're in um, red self-existing moon, okay? And it's interesting because the guide is also the serpent. So there's a lot of stuff going on with the lower chakras and understanding the delusions and the deception and wonky power relations and actually overcoming that. And, um, you know, serpent energy is kundalini as well. It's life force energy. And a lot of people are finding that, you know, COVID time was perfect at traumatizing the people a little bit. And now people are more actively engaged with things like ancestral karma and trauma. A lot of people went through recent awakenings over lockdowns. And, and some people are very fast going, I know I need to do something about my ancestors and very quick they're coming online because this code of the red moon is really within them, okay? And a few months ago, um, an elder who I worked with said the Native Americans have said their ancestral portal for healing is open right now. So this is a really good time for, for, for activating, especially within our own singular unit self-remembrance, who am I, where am I from, what are my roots, okay, and, and also to utilize connection to water, giving offerings to water, things like that, um, as, as, a, as a feedback, because what water is the, connect, the connector, the conductor of our DNA, and we now know that epigenetics uh, shows that just as we in, inherit karma of, of the ancestors that manifests as trauma and wounds and patternings and samskaras, so too, we can clear that and bring that to the next generation cleansed. And so water is the conductor of actually our DNA. So working with water and doing ancestor work is, is a really good thing to do right now. Self-existing is the number four. So it's a very boxed off energy. It's quite regimented. Um, it, it yearns for stability. But I, I really noticed recently that self-existing sometimes means that some of the shadow is it's a little bit preoccupied in self and this is of course a trauma reaction when we're just getting by we don't have capacity for dharma and for others you know quite insular and in the being because we're informed by our trauma and i guess what i can say is that if that's what's necessary over these months for somebody to heal 
box themselves off, do the work on self. Don't worry too much about the outer world, because as we say in the 10 year countdown, there's an opportunity for that to go to a larger audience and for that to be dedicated to the collective in time in four years. OK, so, yes, there's a bit of a shadow of self existing, maybe being a bit self absorbed and the serpent, again, can be quite egoic. OK, and we're going to see that coming through some of the other uh, readings of where the karmic nodes are and some feel things I'm feeling are, re are really up at the moment. I guess I, I'll probably allude to it more in a minute, but uh, there's a lot of sexual manipulation, especially by women at the moment around Instagram and things like that. And that's obviously a, a, wo a wound being wielded and some lower chakra stuff that's playing out in, um, in a way that's making quite a lot of people feel uncomfortable. Um, and, and that would be the shadow of Red Moon and Red Serpent, but it's also sitting in the karmic nodes. And it's really interesting because the karmic nodes change just as the energy of the year changes um, in the galactic Mayan calendar. And it's going to go into something else. So it, it's really good when we see like, this madness on Instagram and then you kind of go, well, that's actually this in the sign. And just leave them to be a bit picky at the moment because it's, you know, they're just in a process because everything's perfect. It's a process. And, and if you just look at these signs, it's, it's, you know, that's, that's there. Okay. So, and we're going to see that play out more. There's a lot about materialism, what the concept of what individualism is. And if you see there's just all these 12 year old life coaches and people who want to be like very rich healers and celebrity shamans and, um, this whole thing of being highly remunerated, but not actually having many qualifications, you know, that's that's all quite childish stuff. Um, and it's it, it it's in its real, it's almost like a call for a cry for help. And what's happening is a lot of people are mentioning to me that people who've been playing that out, they can all there's already a bit of a healing crisis starting for those people. And it's bang on point of the timeline. So, you know, there will be people will have to do, we all have to do work on the ego. We all have to do work with our wounds and our lower central stuff. But uh, yeah, you know, you can see it there. So, you know, it's gonna be bonkers for a little while. Okay. There's also stuff about codependency, but also love and loyalty and finding soul tribe here. And I think that's been a really big thing for people over COVID time was, it was whittling things away. And that's where the karmic nodes were. They were culling stuff. It's like, you know what? That person that you don't really get on with, you don't really have to see them again, yeah? Because there's a sense that if we're going to come into a new chapter, we need to have the right soul groupings. And I know quite a lot of people who are splitting up from partners who are even maybe, you know, the father of their children. But it's kind of time. It's like, I have to do my dharma and you're on a different path and let's just, let's just leave it. So there's a whole new seeking for guilds for like-minded beings to co-create with okay so that can be really on the moment as well the human is a lot about wisdom but it's also about free will so free will is something that often seems like we don't have it um people think we're in this ai computer game um a lot of people felt they didn't have any say during what they were regulated as or to or sorry I'm not wording that very well basically the COVID time felt very repressive for a lot of people um, and so that can be yielding this energy of I you know I have to have my sovereignty here and that's a really big thing you know if you look um, there there's quite a big shift in consensus about what went on in COVID and, and that's going to be there's going to be a healing process over that in coming times as people realize to have body sovereignty to have sovereignty to know um uh, to follow their own truth and find out what that is so that's going to be that that's in the field at the moment and you're going to see how that's really going to start kicking in in the next few days okay in a bigger way and then the challenge to become the gift has been the storm. And that's in many ways to activate um, things. Um, it's like a deep purge of energy. And, and what we can say with the challenge energy is that the challenge becomes the gift. So because we're talking about the year lord and it's this sign, we're just about halfway through the galactic year. So this catalyzing, this bigger yang, activation of things i think people be like i know i want to be about this. Um, and then it's going to be like boom because we've had mars in retrograde so people have been quite tired 
uh, there's um, a lot less people are lackluster. But that's all in a few days, Mars, Mars is going direct again. And then basically, as we get this Aquarian energy coming in, which I'm going to be talking about, we're going to get this deeper sense of activation. You're really going to see how that just maps. I'm talking dream spell calendar here. You're going to see how that maps exactly with the Vedic timelines. And some things are totally a change in one of these systems, and it's happening exactly the same day in the Vedic system. It's, it's so uncanny, you know? Okay, so sorry that I'm <laughs> taking time, but I want you to feel the energies of what we're in. Um, I'm going to go next to the, the traditional Mayan calendar because um, early February, we're coming into, or maybe it's not early, it's, uh, it's mid-February, we're coming into a new year energy and it's number 11, Ech. Ech is like the path, the road, okay? Understanding the path, right? And number 11 is a very wandering energy. Sometimes it means that we have to try several paths to find the true path. And there may be things that will present which will seem like the path, but not be. And that is really evident with the astrology of this divine spark that I'm coming to talk about, this delusional property that we will speak of later, which is going to mean that some people, if they are not using their body and their tantric abilities properly, they will go off on a wild goose chase, okay? Something else about 11, see, see 11, 11 moves in, it's, I was an 11, okay? And you'll, most of you know, I've traveled a lot and I've been really in source to spirit, in service to spirit. And, um, you know, just, I'll be, I'm like, I've got to go and play and go to this place. And it's like a dot to dot picture. You don't know what it is until you actually see it, yeah? So that's very much 11 energy. It actually manifests later as it matures into stability but it can be quite an unstable period. And that's what people are saying, this is gonna be quite an unstable year. And we'll look at that more. The good thing is to know that, you know, there's a method to the madness, but just be careful and be shrewd. It also can manifest 11, one of the shadows of 11 is also that it can mean that we've inherited this kind of legacy of being too trusting sometimes with the wrong people. And we've had to learn our way of being more judicious around who we're hanging out with. And, you know, we're already seeing that with this pull and this shifting of whose soul tribe that's up. 11A is here to do, to do this instability to really deconstruct who we are and what we need and who we hang out with. And it comes also, it comes into a number six and also comes into a number 12, depending on how you're looking at the systems. Either way, it's coming into deep, deep stability. So, um, so sometimes you're, you, you will have a few scenarios that you have to undertake. It's usually karma, yeah? But as you go through that karma, you know, like people get these fated soulmate moments and things like that, and it's actually it's just really crap. But, you know, things like that could be a little bit of the energy that happens. Uh, but don't worry, because it's leading to stability. Next year is a 12 year in, in the system. So, so it, it, it's leading, it's, it's a path that's going to show us the path by the end, but it will take us a little bit off piece sometimes. And it will show us sometimes multiple paths and, um, and then we'll just have to, to find our way. Okay. Now, um, as we go into the galactic uh, calendar new year, we are going to be on a white overtone wizard. Okay. So, Wizard is, it's like a female shaman energy. It's quite shamanic. Um, it can be very much connected to nature and sacred sites. It's also connected to jaguar energy. And jaguar energy is really related to the sacral chakra. And I would say, if we were to say red serpent is like power and wonky stuff, the jaguar is really using the sacral chakra to cleanse heavy energy and to make a protective maternal space for the greater good. Number five, five is, is, is work. It, it is about empowering, but it cannot be lazy. It's not passive even, and it's very much about using yin ways. So as we self remember who we are and uh, that we are a divine yin yang vessel, it will be important to work, work at our not being yang actually. You know, I think we're in this massive rising of the feminine and all the tribes speak of this. 
And that's why we have some crazy femininity, because the thing is that the wounds are playing out at the moment. And that's really evident at the moment. But as we come into this more yin, timeless, receptive energy, true femininity has a balance with receptivity, okay? Uh, so there's this kind of manipulative, grabbing, aggressive femininity that's around a lot at the moment. And, and this is for everybody. It's not just for people in a female body. It's about us suddenly working at really being more in flow with time and, and deeper connection to the earth. And, and, and you know what? Because of Pluto coming into Aquarius, which I'm going to speak of later, that is actually super important, okay? It's really important to use the archetypes of the moon, the serpent, the earth, the jaguar at the moment, and, and to maybe use shamanic archetypes because some friends have said, you know, with Pluto coming into Aquarius, it's coming into Aquarius this year, but only for a little baby moment, but it's going to really kick off next year. If people are not in their bodies, if they've not done their embodiment work and their trauma work, they could really find it difficult because there is going to be a lot of AI and a lot of novel stuff, and it can be very hard to be embodied, okay? So this will be a really good year to work at embodiment, but also to do that by working with the land and sacred sites. The grandmothers, I'm writing a section at the moment in my book about the grandmothers, this yin receptivity and, and dreaming before doing and not just rushing around like a freak. And so that's maybe why we've got this kind of 11, oh, we're finding the path, we're finding the path, we're finding the path. And then actually there's the grandmother, this yin thing going, shut up and sit down for 10 minutes, drink a cup of tea, and then we'll see which the right path is, okay? So there's this dance between these year lords and the different systems, but it will help if we're really embodied, okay? So yeah, just read the little bit I wrote um, about this being, oh yeah, I'll just tell you, it's also an, a seven year in, in numerology. In, and so this is associated with K2. And K2 is, K2 has the body, but no head. And that's very much like the 11 wandering. It's like the renunciant, it, it's kind of, it, it's, it's not passive because it's very spiritual. It's not greedy, it's not materialistic but it's a little bit confused because it doesn't, it's kind of blind, it doesn't see, it doesn't, it doesn't really move around greatly. Um, and as such, K2 dissolves things. It, it makes us let go of material desires and connections. And so it's a very spiritual placement and energetic, but that will mean a lot of letting go. And interestingly, you know, it's a very unmaterialistic sign. And we're looking at a massive, global meltdown you know and so this thing is like yeah people are going to be forced to become more spiritual or at least those who have it in their karma to do so are going to have that with the seven and seven is a very spiritual number as well as you know it's in so many systems and it's also very serpentine so you see this is a real dance with the system okay so back to the little bit individual self-remembrance trauma and ancestral healing is lining up ahead of a deeper collective healing in the coming years. We need to avoid self-cherishing. So this is this thing about too much poor me and too much like vulnerable shares and all these things that are quite manipulative. You know, that's not, not great for this time, okay? But it may be that that's what's needed for people to heal. So we have to have a non-dual acceptance, people just going through this stuff, right? We're finding a pathway through a period of instability and dissolving of old contracts and relationships. We need to work at becoming more empowered in surrendering to the universe, to yin receptivity, and a higher way of being and dharma. Okay. No. Okay. So, oof, this little land. I'm going to have a little break, a little bathroom break after this slide. So you could all know that you can have that too. Okay. So, um, Saturn. So these are some big influences. Tons of influences. I. I'm leaving out lots of things like Mercury retrograde because there's lots of things that you'll hear about all the time. You can find it out yourself. You'll, everybody knows when Mercury retrograde is or an eclipse. So I'm, 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 I'm limiting my discussion on those things. And there are met tons of, of, of big influences here, this year, but I'm just gonna talk about some biggies, okay? So you've heard me talking about this already, Saturn in Aquarius, okay? Now, some of you would be like, but Saturn's already done Aquarius, it's already there. No, yes and no, okay? So in Western astrology, yes. In Vedic astrology, Saturn came into Aquarius for three months last year. 
On the 17th of this month, uh, in Vedic astrology, if you're looking at sidereal astrology, it's approximately the 24th of the month, we've got Saturn coming into Aquarius. And this is a biggie. So Saturn is master of time. Saturn is karma, sacrifice, hard work, disease, breath, wind. It's slow moving. It's, it's quite cold. It wants us, it's materialistic. And it, it really, it's the one that people are afraid of because it's like Saturn's rings clutch us. And you know, when we get one of those big, kind of slightly hysterical eureka moments, it's like, no, you're not doing that because it doesn't want us to make the mistakes we did in past lives. And especially Saturn is very strong, usually for spirit workers, because we're the sort of people who might have died as witches or done something a bit silly last life. And it's like, we want you to do your dharma, but don't rush, okay? So sometimes we can see a lot of people who are going really fast in life, but they're usually going to get their own karmic slaps about that. Saturn's great. Saturn is, is Saturn is that re reality check that we need. And it's that thing that's about learning to make sacrifices, learning that suffering and hardship do exist, that we are in, in samsara and that is here. And it really wants us to overcome those through work and through meeting things head on. And it often means a lot of delays in things. So Saturn's just been in Capricorn. And what we're lucky because Saturn is in its two homes. It's coming into its office. It's been in its home. And Capricorn is pretty determined, quite, um, quite rule-based. Uh, Capricorn is, is very Saturnian, okay? And it's a goat. It can strive. It works steadily to things. It can be a lot about governance systems, rules, law, things like that. And there's a real sense that we've been in that, you know, not only have we all been very regulated while Saturn was in Capricorn, the whole planet was in a regulation, but now we're coming into a new energy. And now Aquarius, you'll all know Aquarius is seen as a bit of a rule breaker. It's quite a lot about societies and novel developments. It's quite anarchic, um, but it's got a vision for a higher way of being. Hey. Um, and, and so it's, it's, it's more creative and it's more of a, a visionary to some degree. And so Saturn, Saturn's, you know, Saturn gets bad rep. And so people think Saturn's just there to be miserable. But Saturn's actually quite happy when it goes into Aquarius as well. And so Aquarius is, is, is where Saturn's getting better to put its feet up on the desk and stuff like that. Just be a little bit more chilled out. And... I'm, I'm going to talk about my experience in recent times, because most of you on this call are in feminine bodies at the moment. Uh, what I've experienced from this period of Saturn and Capricorn, I've done a lot of really deep initiations with a male llama, yeah? And when Saturn came into Aquarius for three months last year, I really, I was getting this kind of feminine wrath about masculine systems. And somehow this like, need to speak. And I've been speaking to so many sisters um, who are feeling this, it's time for our voice. Because a lot of, for instance, I've worked with a lot of indigenous tribes. Usually it's the men who talk. Uh, a lot of different systems. It's sometimes there's this kind of like dad-like thing where they just don't hear us. And there's just something that's been rising where a lot of women are now feeling that they've been priming their voice, that they're ready to speak because it wasn't the right time before. And now there, there are things that our body and our experience and our vantage point, it's almost like it's time to let that be spoken. And in a way, we've had to be overcoming our wounds and our karma about that. But also we've had to learn the masculine way. I've spoken to a lot of very accomplished sisters who've gone for the last three years and gone and worked with like um, very, very senior African lineage holders and things like that. And they've learned from really deep root lineages. And I've worked with very deep root lineages. I really worked in the law. And I've worked with the law keepers of many indigenous tribes. And so, you know, I understand the law. And we have to understand it in order to then move, up, move from it. So there's a sense of something rising with Saturn coming into Aquarius. And Saturn will be about finding the rules. But it will be about how we expand into new possibilities. Because people who are just in like a tribal representative or just in a male body, they're, they're anchoring something that they've held for, for lifetimes and for uh, through their family line. 
but we have different cultures and different ways of seeing and we have to understand how things work in order to build upon them and improve them and it will be to some of us who are the more visionary weirdos to make the new system and it's not about being so disillusioned with the whole planet that we think we get rid of it all it's about understanding what we apply what is a given and what we're going to deviate from okay so uh so that's on that's coming that's going to be like imminently in like just over a week we're, we're starting to hit that energy and i think a lot of people are starting to feel something's rising in them something that they need to expand into that this concept of this more multi-dimensional world that we speak of is becoming a little bit more tangible okay and so you see jupiter's gone way through saturn and aquarius saturn's catching up but it's like the rules, the system, the karma we've got with that. We've got to go through all of that. And so it's going to be amazing because uh, we're, we're all going to have liftoff, you know, in a steady way. And karma as well. We've all got a Saturn in Aquarius and Saturn's comfortable there. So Saturn's really going to be yielding some really big teachings. It's, it's deep wisdom, okay? And as well, because it is Kronos, the master of time, if we work with time and space and karma, we can really become a visionary for the next time, timeline and to really get the golden age running. Okay. Now, on to Pluto in Aquarius. Basically, uh, on the 23rd of March, I believe, approximately that, some astrologers say different things, Pluto which is the most idle planet. Um, and we don't really look at that so much in Vedic astrology, but Pluto is a lot of the hidden things, a lot of transpersonal energy, a lot of deep transformation energy. And a lot of people fear Pluto as well. Pluto is coming into Aquarius and it's, it's got, going to have a little kiss there. And it's going to be there for until, from March the 23rd till about the, the 11th of June. OK, and then it's going to come back in in January. So this is a little bit like what Saturn did last year. We get this this kiss, this little feeling again. And, and so when we look at different generations, we look at like the boomers or the Generation Xs and the millennials. We're usually looking at cycles of Pluto. OK, so we're coming out of this batch of beings who, and it's about two decades long. OK, so we're going to have this Aquarian energy that's totally, totally about Pluto shifts. Pluto boots out anything that is not serving right now under that planetary influence. So I think it's very easy for people to see that a lot of people want system change. And on one hand, we have people talking about smart cities and everybody being a robot and, um, you know, having chips in your head or whatever it is. And other people are talking about let's have new systems and where, you know, we're all working more collectively, we're more telepathic. And, um, you know, some people are talking everything's AI and some people are like, we are beyond AI because we've got the technology within us and all these magic kids are coming. So it's very, very interesting that what we've got is a little kiss of Pluto. Now, uh, it's, it, it feels, if you've, if you've listened to my explanation of Capricorn and Aquarius, we've got all this discussion of changing laws and things like that, but nothing's really happened. We're then going to come into a big fat shakeup when Pluto comes into Aquarius. And then there's this retrograde back in to Capricorn uh, which is going to, well, some people are saying, are we going to have wars? We could. A lot of astrologers said this is going to be a year that there could be big wars. And that can be sometimes in the cusp of this mindfuck of what is going on between these two energies. But also because the energies will be changing, it can mean that energy will be one thing and then three months later, something different. So Things like wars sometimes have to, I mean, there's an escalation of a war. There's things like that that take place. Um, it's, there's a lot of volatility with this changing energy, but whatever we can say, when we retrograde into Pluto uh, being in Capricorn for the last time, I do feel there's going to be significant shifts to, to some laws, you know, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of exposés about certain things coming up at the moment. And um, so, 
there could be quite a lot of legal review. There could be quite a lot of like rebellious energy, riot type energy. You know, if we even look at what's happening in China at the moment, there are a lot of riots. There's a lot of stuff undocumented. When we look at the global economies, a lot of the major economies, you know, know there's a massive global recession. They're, they're, the economists are all talking about it, especially from the third, the second quarter and the third quarter of the year. Um, and for those of you in the UK, you know, there was a little band-aid put on what was going to make the UK the equivalent of a developing country. And it just takes a little wobble for that little thing to, to explode again. And a lot of astrology shows that the US and the UK have a lot of heavy karma to work through this year. So yeah, so we've got a very interesting thing happening there. And I'm just gonna ask Chrissy, do you wanna do a very quick, just little uh, deeper um, discussion on Pluto and Aquarius? Sure. Thank um, you. Yeah. You know, I have to say, like, I think the most important thing with these energies is the sovereignty that you have with it. Because um, I've seen some of those readings where people are like, oh, wars. And it's like they went straight to the fear. So if you find yourself like in that fear like you have a choice if you are going to stay there or if you're going to look to what's actually really opening and being created at this time as Pluto goes in and, and does this very deep not comfortable <laughs> transformation work um yeah like there's it's where are we going to have our focus because even as this is happening, like we have Kuiper belt objects coming in and they're bringing in this very quantum creation energy. So it's like, we have that ability where we can create from nothing. Um, even as stuff on the 3D can get kind of rocky, it's like we have that focus. Where's our our focus going to be and what do we want to create um consent and sovereignty has been coming in very strongly for me um because we in the u.s we have our pluto return so i am expecting there's a lot of big change that will be happening but it's like no i'm gonna hold my energy on the foundation of like what i believe and you know we the people like very important and that is Aquarius is people humanitarian so that's again just the the, the choice that we have to put our focus so yeah um and, and just moving into this this more cancer or feminine yin way of, of being is is part of that coming into very strongly so yeah thank you so much Chrissy and I totally mm -hmm. agree you know that's what we see with the human glyph in the energy of the year it's all just an illusion for us to dance through none of it needs to affect us and especially this is why we help to prepare you to see what's coming because things have to change and you know the karma is those who are um, in those systems for us, this is a time to celebrate and be really excited, okay? So it may mean upheavals, but everything is, is, is it's all just a dump. So it's all good, okay? So I'm just gonna talk quickly about the Jupiter-Rahu con conjunction, which is beginning um, in late April, and it, it's got a peak time. And this is called the Guru Chandal Yoga. And Rahu is the head of the serpent. It's the karmic node that's the more futuristic part of us. And Jupiter, as we know, is the great benefic, the guru. It, it's also an, ex, it's an expander. It expands us into good, good life, generosity, dharma, a higher path, wealth in a good way. And so, and, and, and Rahu is more greedy and materialistic. And we've got them both sitting together. We also have Saturn aspecting them, which I think is a godsend. Basically, this energy is going to be sitting in the nakshatra of Ashvini. And Ashvini is, is the first of the nakshatras of the, si of the zodiac, in a way. There are different people and different astrologers who use different starter points for different things. 
But in this particular instance, we're looking at as a starter point, okay? And it's right at the beginning of Aries. And so we basically got Jupiter and Rahu activating the beginning, the, the, the part of the divine spark in our charts. Aries represents the divine spark. It's a pioneering energy. And again, that's aligned with this storm energy that I said is going to become more prevalent later. It aligns totally with that. This sparking up, this catalyzing, this purge to make good stuff and new stuff. So Ajvini energy that is the nakshatra, the celestial energy that's connected with these planets at that time is very fast moving. It's, and it's got a real connection to healing and healing abilities. And there is a sense of aqu the Aquarian age. I think those of us who are working as healers, we know that our quantum work, just as, as Chris would say, there's, this, there's all this quantum energy around. We're going into a deeper sense of shared space and timelines and work through that. And I feel that there's going to be this three-month activation that people will receive. <laughs> and for those of us who are working with healing arts, it's almost like you're going to get this flash of inspiration about where you're headed and where things are and the gifts. Now, what I see a lot of uh, always is, you know, in the new age and when people have quick awakenings, often, oh, they had their awakening five minutes ago. They've got a YouTube channel about it next week. And uh, that's the sort of thing we're going to see a lot of. This is the shadow of Guru Chandal Yoga, this conjunction, is that people go a bit mental and a bit deluded. So you, this whole journey with this uh, dodgy serpent show off, uh, I'm a guru thing, that, that may have another layer of delusion between uh, April and July. So you can see, and this, this is also this going off in these wild paths energy of the, like the 11 eh, okay. Now, the good thing is that Saturn's there keeping an eye on things because it's got an, an aspect on it. So it is going to be like, guys, sober up, sober up. So I do think it's a real godsend that that's there. I think that if you are somebody who works with yoga and the, 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 the lower center chakras and the things like the root lock, this is a real time within your, your vessel to anchor energies and to utilize that spark. Like in, in uh, Tibetan Buddhist uh, yogas, we have tumo practice where we're cultivating the inner fire and then we're doing massive work with, with the inner fire. So you see the people who are not cultivating are gonna be like, oh, and then the, the, the idea is to go, I'm harnessing this multidimensional wisdom. I see this flash of the next years to come, and I'm going to work steadily with it because that's obviously always what the planets want us to do. And Saturn's going to be like, remember, remember the thing. And a lot of people will not pass that initiation and they'll lose. It's just like what people do with sexual energy. People are addicted to orgasms and squirting. We had this person, uh, my friend and I were talking about this. And basically, all these things are lessening the life force energy. And again, that's the serpent sitting up there. Are you going to dissipate the life force energy or are you going to harness it for a higher spiritual gain for the collective? And you see, when we cultivate that, that's actually when we're temp making, making a multidimensional template for this higher Siddic superpower energy to come in. So there will be those who look at the Ishvini divine spark and, and take it to the ego level. If you cultivate and hold the energy, you can actually take it to the full being level and up to the multidimensional plane, okay? So that's a little bit of a, a heads up. Um, you all have this. Everybody's gonna have a divine spark. And um, therefore, it's helpful for you to know where your Jupiter and Rahu are going to be placed from the end of April, because you can then harness it and be aware. So it's gonna be a great little time. It really feels, it, it's very much, here, this is what Aquarius wants to bring. And the, this whole timeline of Pluto and Aquarius, it's almost like the preview, okay? And if you treat it as such, rather than that it's the whole meal, it's, um, it's, it's like it's warming you up to something really divine. But don't, you, don't, you, don't waste that energy, all right? Uh, this slide is just really, it's, a, it's just a recap of what, what's been in the weaving so far, of just uh, what we're looking at. and. Um, and some of the hypothesized uh, themes coming up, okay? So some of the energies to ponder in 2023, a lot of people are talking about war and instability. Again, it's just a purge. And um, talking about the economics, um, which of course, when we look at the K2 energy, is a lot about maybe 
becoming more spiritual. You know, so many people go off course because they get really into money um, and into having too much, too many material possessions. And you meet a lot of people. If you, if you look, a lot of people who win the lottery by chance, often it's the worst thing that happens to them. And a lot of them end up committing suicide or losing all the money. So there are, there's always a, a higher metaphysical purpose for any, uh, any instability that comes across. Okay, so we look at the individualism and the ego and how that may be playing out. We'll look at that a little bit more again. Uh, there's some energy up that does show that, again, our concept of travel is changing a little bit. And we've all known that we, we, there are environmental issues that are mentioned about, about flying and, and things like that. And I think a lot of people are finding that travel is changing. I mentioned self-cherishing and the self-existing energy. Of course, you know, that's a shadow that can come into deeper collaboration when people have gone through their healing journey with that. Then talk about this Aquarian energy that's kicking in and this countdown to the golden age. And then we've got this thing about some of these new age egoic healing patterns that are misleading quite a lot of people that that seems to be peaking. And when something peaks, what happens next? Okay, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of this is, is a saturation of some things that's then coming to transformation. Okay, I've also mentioned just this thing about AI, satellites, smart cities which is how some people like to look at it. But for me, it's, uh, you know, sometimes we're, we're, we're presented with something because we're going to bring something in that's, that's just even more amazing. Uh, I, a lot of people like to talk about, oh, AI is gonna take over and all of these things, but look at us, we're in a massive growth. We are the beings with divine consciousness and connected to the divine. And so, why would AI take over what we have the technology within to do? We are growing, and that's why AI seems like it's growing beyond us, because if we think we're staying here, they ask AI is coming beyond us, but actually we're going here. So AI will be here. It's still our servant, okay? So um, if we have more faith and trust in our own development, we don't need to worry about things like that, okay? And then I mentioned this divine spark or the full-scale delusion. Um, that we may have and then yeah just how to weather the storm and to utilize this storm to activate great things and to step in and it's very much correlating with what Chrissy said we use our sovereignty we use our free will and we can actually utilize this year in an amazing way look at COVID for, for many people it, it's meant people learn to work from home got to really look at who they are you know it's been it, it's, it's a blessing you know it's all great okay so now I'm going to do a little bit of a countdown for these coming months, just to tell you a little bit about the weaving. And I guess what I want to start with is that people commonly go happy new year in January and think that everything's got to start in January. And, and then there's this kind of wonky clunkiness with the body because they don't really feel like that. And it will change with the astrology of every year. But certainly in the global north, people, most people I know are sick at the moment. They certainly do not have any sparkiness. And there's often this delusion, which makes people then go out of sync because they're so busy trying to feel this new year vibe. Now, certainly for the last few years when I've been giving these reports, uh, it, it's uncanny how much the astrology always lines up with actually the equinox, which is actually seen as the astrological new year in, in, in numerous systems. So I'm going to talk us through these months and what's happening, because often it, it means that you go, oh, good, I'm, there's nothing wrong with me. OK, I'm not letting this, the team down, because this is where we often create shame. We paralyze ourselves because we're putting our energies to the wrong place. OK, so this is this countdown to help you know. OK, so as I mentioned, Mars has been making people feel quite lethargic. It's now going into um, direct phase from the 12th and it's going into Gemini. So it's not necessarily in its happiest place. Mars and, and Mercury are, are not friends, but um, it is going direct nonetheless, okay? So people will see a lot more movement um, and there will be a bit of a spark. There will sometimes be things around communications and it's interesting that it happens while Mercury is retrograde. Um, sometimes it means that things come up a, a little bit like this, but that's going to move into cancer a few months later, okay? But it still means that there's a little bit more momentum. 
for those of you who are sensitive to astrology, you'll already probably have felt it. I had like a couple of months because Mars was in my 12th house where, you know, I was a binge watching TV. I don't watch TV. And I was just like having to empty. And then I went in a different phase where I started working again. It was almost like I had to just think rest. I had to, I had to become a radical rester. Yeah. And then that has actually given me the strength to, uh, and the drive. I had to, uh, to spark up again. And I'm really like yesterday, I had a very productive day because I'm, you know, a lot of the time we'll start to feel it as it's coming in. So you'll probably feel a big change in momentum. And don't worry if you've been having things like headaches, lethargy. It's very common with Mars retro. Okay. Then I mentioned Saturn into Aquarius in the 17th. So again, another sparking energy, a new energy coming in. Now, when we look at the Mayan systems and the dream spell system, what's happening? Okay. So today, this is why we're doing it today. We're in the, we hit the ego wave spell, which is all about seeing the bigger picture. It's visionary energy. And this is a little bit of a mantra here. So, you know, what are we doing today? We're creating a bigger vision to be ahead of the game, to understand how things work so we can help ourselves and help our communities and steer ourselves to the right place for us. Eagle energy is very abundant because it's got its eyes on the prize in the right way. It's an intermediary between heaven and earth. And as it's got this higher vantage point, it can see, oh, that's ahead. I need to, I need to divert my course or I need to do this. I need to warn my friends. Okay. And Blue Eagle is very much about our role in planetary service. The eagle is there. It's, it's, it's connected to the heart chakra. It's beyond singular gain. <laughs> okay. So that's us. We've got a 13 day period of that. Excuse me. We have a 13 period of that starting today. And in the, the traditional Mayan calendar, we're coming into Achmak Trisena in a few days. And Achmak's picture is up here in the corner, the right hand corner. So Achmak is um, an interesting energy. It has a certain level of intelligence, but it's really about redemption in this system. Achmak, in a lot of us are energy sensitive and sometimes we go through very deep moments and clearing, almost like we're doing it for the collective. Achmak energy can be very much like that. If there's a group of people walking down the street and there's a pothole, Achmak's the person who falls in because it's almost like they take the karmic blows, okay? And they can sometimes be a source of ridicule because people are like, oh yeah, there was the one who was falling in the potholes. But actually, what are they doing? You know, there's a higher metaphysical way of looking at Ahmad. And this is very much, if we look at this, this, this thing of clearing ancestral karma and trauma and redemption, it's sometimes doing the bodhisattva thing and saying, I will take on the suffering and I want to do this for all people. And so Ahmak has selfless energy. It, it doesn't have any choice really, but by having that mechanism within its being, it does have a possibility to overcome karma and to overcome very heavy uh, wounds that can reside in the collective. So it may be that things, are, that the things come up for you uh, in that period and, and just see, see how that goes. Again, it's definitely not a yang energy, is it? We, we've got a visionary energy that's assessing the field and Akbak is doing massive clearing and that doesn't finish there, okay? So the next Trisena in the traditional Mayan calendar that comes in is Toch energy. And Toch is also, it, it's very much connected to the role that takes place that, that we often have in a tribe who are the people who give the payments and the offerings. And it's also about burning like the wick of, of the candle to burn the burdens of the past. If we don't make our payments, don't give our land offerings and things like that, we're not, we're not in right relation to the earth. And so when talk energy is around, it's really good to do earth offerings and earth work ceremony to honor the ancestors and to give our payments to the earth. Sometimes people who have talk energy and their ancestral energy, you can see that they've created, they've, they've, cre they've uh, inherited a legacy of kind of bad luck or heavy karma because their ancestors maybe were skeptical of paying back. So again, it's like this bit of the year is, is it's, it, it's a bit like get, get yourself straight, give your offerings, show remorse, do good things, uh, pay back, be forthcoming be in reciprocity with the landscape 
And, and it's almost like by doing that, it, it's almost, how would I say? It's almost like a diary or an investment that will help you to, to weather the energies that are coming to know where your place is. Because in true natural law, we always give back first. We don't take first. So you're almost giving a sacred code as we come into these disruptive energies to say, I choose natural law. And when you do that, it supersedes the fall of um, the US or China or nothing that's important because it's like, I'm friends of the trees, me. Yeah. So there's a really beautiful spiritual gift here as we start January of giving back and doing that work to get yourself clean and clear doing that cleaning work. And you know, a lot of people do get this detox feeling at the beginning of the year. So also it's good. Do cleansing, do offerings, give back. All of that would be really helpful. Now in the uh, Galactic Mind calendar, uh, the energy from the 21st is star wave spell. And again, star, star is light and creative. A lot of my star friends love doing that. They're very good at like interior design and houses have always got nice things in them. But it's also about elegant flow. It's definitely not about rampaging ahead and being the winner of the game, okay? So again, and it's a it's, it's beauty way, it's quite creative. So again, it, it, it's quite Venusian and it also is connected to starseed energy. So starseed energy sometimes is that we have manifested pain to come for this, this earthly mission. And, and starseed is very much connected to Bodhisattva, which is this thing of understanding to be able to do this mission that we've come for and sometimes having had like a difficult childhood and not feeling like you belong, okay? But it's not demanding very yang, action-based, go-getter stuff, okay? Definitely not happening in January, okay? So in short, January is a good time to spend visioning and paying back, get your relationship with nature, law, ancestors and universe right, and the rest will start to line up, okay? Okay, now on to February. Okay, now this is really, really interesting. If you're a geek. Um, now, so 3rd of February, we start a new galactic spin. And this is in the dream spell calendar, the galactic Mayan calendar. So what is a galactic spin? A galactic spin is a new gestation of 260 days, okay? So approximately, it's under nine months, but we go through a new spin every, every 260 days. It means that we've gone through every tone and every sign and their combinations once, and then a new gestation begins. So it's always a really good thing. Homework is around the time of the 3rd of Feb, have a look at what you were doing around uh, 260 days before, and then see where you're augmenting. There's often very potent telltale signs about what you're gestating gestating as so we come into this this cosmic nurturing gestational dreaming energy okay now uh so what's happening is then we have the dragon wave spell so that's this dreamy primordial activation energy it's not thought it's multi-dimensional okay but it does it it is a magic gestation and in the traditional mind calendar a few days later we're going to come into it tracena and it gets like the breath the speech, it's quite strong energy. Sometimes it's too strong. Sometimes, you know, our, our words can hurt. So it's got to be careful about, about how it harnesses its speech, okay? And interestingly, we'll just, just, we'll, we'll just have come out of Mercury retrograde and then the bit after Mercury retrograde where it's still reassembling into direct Mercury, okay? Now, bang on the galactic spin, Rahu enters the Ashwini energy that I spoke of earlier. Jupiter's not there yet, but Rahu, who's greedy, wants to do everything, materialistic, got loads of drive, bit of deception, quite exotic, quite into technology. It's in Ashwini, these speedy twins who are into healing, okay? So we've got this, this, this activation of energies that isn't fully realized because you know, a baby or, or, or an embryo, it's not an action phase, yeah? There's something, that's something brewing, okay, from February, all right? And then on the 16th of February, we come into the wizard wave spell. So I spoke earlier of wizard energy a little bit more um, earlier um, because we're coming into wizard year uh, in July. So wizard has got this feminine yin way. It's about becoming receptive to what we're going to do. And also get ourselves energetically right, you know, align with nature, 
doing our clearing work, working on our lower centers and being receptive. So what does a shaman do? A shaman reads signs, you know? So also look at what the universe is, is saying to you to help you to know that you're in your right place. Because especially because um, any day after that, we, yeah, on the 19th, we're coming into 11 eh. Look at what the universe is telling you so you don't go on wild goose chases, okay? And um, in the traditional Mayan calendar, we're in Sikkin uh, Chisena, and this is, the, this is the eagle. So we've had a dance with the eagle being over there in the dream spell calendar, now in the traditional calendar, where again, we're back to visioning, we're back to dreaming, okay? And, and seeing the, the higher vantage point. So again, February's still saying, okay, give back, give back. But uh, now I start to vision a bit, okay? Let's start to receive the insights. We've given, we've given to the universe. What's the universe telling us how we act, okay? And this is the way you can get, make sure you're on your Dharma path. If you do this procedure of natural law and the way it dances, you'll, you'll not be like pulled away with the wrong energies and waste time and use vital life force energy, okay? So then the new solar, solar year in the Mayan calendar, the 11 Ech kicks in on the 19th. And then right at the very, very end of, of Feb, we've got Jupiter coming into Revati, Nakshatra, okay? And I will be talking about that in the next slide. So as I say, this is a great month for deepening these gestation energies. It's a full birth energy month, okay? So this is why I think a lot of people are getting sick now in January. It's like the purge to start your cleaning, give back, getting, getting reciprocity, and then you can start to really get things lined up, all right? So yeah, so it's not time to just act yet. And uh, you, because this is, you can act now, but you get slowed down or it won't work or you waste energy because when you harness it, you just it's almost like you do it in your sleep, okay? This is the way the cosmos wants it to be. Okay, March. So Jupiter and Revati. Revati is the last of the nakshatras before it, it, it's the final one of Pisces, okay? So it does sometimes use the symbolism of fish. It's very much seen as a wealthy, generous, altruistic energy. And people will usually talk about it, and it's quite genial, okay? So it, it, it's nice, pleasant energy. Revati are nice people. It, it, it is spiritual, but it's not denoted, it, it's it's got, it is lining up for moksha because the thing is that if we're a nice person, we're generous, we're wealthy in the right way, we will reach liberation in this life. It's about getting our, getting our generosity and our, our altruism and our benevolence in shape. So it does have a connection with liberation from samsara, but it also has a function of being connected to a little bit like what we've done with this galactic spin. It's like uh, understanding what seeds we've got from our journey around the last zodiac to pay into the next cycle. Okay, so Ray Bati has also got this wealth to pay it into the next cycle. And it's going to be paying that into Jupiter coming into Aquarius. Okay, so it's quite nice, expansive energy that Jupiter's in. It, it's benevolent. It's it. it and Jupiter's at home, Jupiter's sitting in Pisces at the moment, so it's comfortable, it's in a very spiritual placement, so that's nice, okay? And, and we've then got also, we've got just after that, we've got, I mean, Jupiter's gonna be in Revati for a while, but on the 1st of March, we've got the hand wave spell. And the hand, it, it can be about things like doing Reiki, things like that. It can be creative work, it can be about using mudra, it's, it, it's also got a sense of knowingness to it. And I really see it as a sign that's very much connected to doing divination and understanding how divination works. So this is a really good time. You've maybe received some signs and insights from the universe to do your divination on it or get somebody to do divination for you. See, do you, is, there, is there a way you do divination or does somebody do cards for you or do you want an astrology reading or whatever? And this is a good time to go into that, to get that sense of knowing um, that's going to start to embody. It's going to then start to get the hands coming to work in however that might be to start to create something. There is now a physical 
legacy that's starting to activate once we get that knowing. It's like we've been in this kind of in multi-dimensional gather, information gathering phase. And then now it's kind of coming into form where we are and now I know what I'm going to do. I've got my seeds of truth. I get it, right? And in the traditional Mayan calendar, we're in this, the equivalent of the star tracenum, which is this nice light energy in that system which uh, also has to understand the darkness as well. But again, it's still about finding the elegant flow, okay? Still not rushing ahead and being crazy. Okay, then on the 14th of March, we come into the sun wave spell. And a few days later, we come into Imosh, which is the equivalent of the dragon, the serpent, or the water lily in the traditional Mayan calendar. And we also have Saturn coming to Shatta Bishak. So we've got a whole new energy. Saturn's coming into a new nakshatra, and I'm going to talk about Shatabishak. And Sun is a lot more sociable, okay? And we're coming close to equinox. And in people in the global north, there's that feeling that spring is somewhat starting, even though usually it's still snowing and things like that. But Sun is a lot more about interaction with community, connecting to the higher self, illuminating things, activating things, okay, in that way. Sun has to be careful of ego, and it also sometimes burns um, or wants to be too dominant in a scenario, but it's still, it, it's starting to crank up in terms of the energetics of these signs, you know, you have solar energy and you have gestational energy coming together, okay? And Saturn's coming into Shatabishak. Now, Shatabishak's an interesting energy. It's known as the 100 physician or the 100 stars, and um, it is a lot of people with Shatabishak energy work with healing. It has a little bit of hermit energy, okay? But it also, Dr. Arjun Pai, who's a prominent Vedic astrologer, says that it's also, it's also called the 100 Avadutes. And Avadutes are actually um, unorthodox, Siddic beings who bring through codes to help us to come to a higher timeline. And the Avaduti is the central channel. So it's like utilizing Kundalini energy and metaphysical knowledge to help things to grow. And it's also a lot of good astrologers have Shatabishak energy. And I actually have my moon in Shatabishak, which is my dominant uh, thing, my dominant nakshatra. So um, what I sense is this really nice window of time. And this is why we're gonna be running our non-dual astrology symposium during Shatabishak is to help people to grasp how to work with the celestial bodies. There's a window to be really connected to the stars and healing. And not only that, but you've got this activation of Shatabishak and this light worker and healing energy. You've got also, also got this speedy Ashwini energy sitting with Rahu and then with Jupiter and Rahu. So we've got a lot saying that there's this novel ideas, new ways of healing, these Aquarian novel ways. I, I know so many of us have thought we're going to work with all these quantum things. It's going to be a whole new way of working. We're going to see and we're going to be working in this multidimensional way. It's on. Okay. And so we're really going to start getting these, these, these growth spurts of it. Okay. Then we have equinox on the 20th. And then in tropical astrology, Pluto comes into Aquarius. So boom, you know, big change comes. So look at how lined up that is with Equinox. Look at all these, these this crescendo and energies that's coming. And then truly we're birthing more in, in a more tangible, physical, material way from Equinox. So it's just really good for you to be able to know like, okay, I've got this timeline to work on things. We then have um, 27th, we have Skywalker with Spell. And I find Skywalker wave spell. I mean, Skywalker's, it, it's very rigid energy. So sometimes it can be quite rigid and a bit control freaky, but it also is, it's really good for harnessing things that have been out in the ether, bringing them onto paper. So often I get, I have times where people say, oh, can you tell me how much I owe for this thing? And I'm like, I don't do numbers today. And in, in Skywalker time, I can write out all my projects really neat and it just flows and very structured. So I find it a very good time for the kind of project management on paper of my work, okay? And I find them usually really prolific. And often we'll do quite a lot of our organizational paperwork, stuff like that in Skywalker, and it just flows. Things that we cannot even think about is just made, is totally logical and easy during Skywalker. 
So that could be a really good time for you to get things lined up in that way, okay? And that's coming into Ish Trisena, which is coming back to, to wizard energy. It's still, still be receptive, still don't be pushy, you know, and still connect through, still do purification, still keep yourself anchored, okay? So this very much is the real new year. And some of these energies, as I say, divination, creativity, inner knowing and activating, a little bit astrological, still a little bit hermit, um, but these light worker insights will increase. There's a big lift off with this Pluto energy, big sort of energetics changing and, and a more social energy, but we still need to get things in order, find our structure in order and get a really good work-life balance and nature work balance. And then jobs probably good in. Okay. Okay. My final little uh, month thing is April. Okay. So um, here we have April, uh, the ninth, we have the World Bridge Away spell. And going in, in, in the traditional mind calendar, we're in Kech Tresena. So World Bridger is often about letting go, sacred transitions, death. And of course, every breath is a life and a death and a rebirth. We have things that we don't stick with, things that need to go to make more space. So we will all probably have a little bit of transitional energy, not to mention that Pluto in Aquarius is doing its thing. Uh, and Saturn in Aquarius is probably really in flow. So you can see this, that's exactly what Pluto does. Pluto is like world bridger. Okay. So um, again, it's very aligned. Okay. And then Trisena is, is oh, sorry, just the Trisena of K is like the deer. The wilderness is very important for K. K has strong leadership. It's the new leadership. Okay. So there can be the sense of, I, well, what I want to say is K relies on nature to have its leadership. It's not, it's not in a, a skyscraper. K needs to reboot. It has to go into nature to be the strong leader that it is. And it's also one of those energies that can be too strong sometimes, too, too rigid, too stubborn. Okay. But it's interesting because that even it, it's like the new leadership emerging. So look at what's happening. And then we could see with this world bridge of wave spell, with this K Tresena. We could see quite a lot on the world stage, new leadership, things ending, systems collapsing a little bit or shifting, or at least signs of it. And of course, we need to manage our own body energies so that we can be, you know, take those transitions that we're in and, and embody them, you know, so that we are in as zen a situation as we can be. So it's just very interesting. And that kind of woof, shifting energy continues because interestingly the challenge to become the gift is really amping up now of the storm activating catalyzing purging we come into the storm wave spell in the 22nd so yeah there's a sense that it can be quite strong strong transformational energy and in the the, the traditional system we're going to be in akutra trasena so there's strong leadership in there as well. Apu, Apu energy people are leaders and there's a spiritual leader energy to that as well. But again, sometimes they can be shining too hard or too domineering. Uh, they have to understand the role of other people around as well. But it is generally a very strong sign. Okay. So there's this sense of transformation and really knowing then and stepping into a deeper sense of who we are and then boom right at that same time and this is people don't look at these systems together right at that same time that guru chandal yoga this jupiter rahu divine spark energy comes in you cannot write this stuff and people are not looking at this look at it it's just there they we dance the time so this is that energy of saying, so we're working up to this crescendo, okay? Very important, okay? And that crescendo sits there until July. So, you know, and, and I will talk a bit more about a few more uh, important bits to look at. But yeah, you know, we just know that you're cultivating energy to bring it up to this. And then you can harness, then you can sustain it. People, some people burn out too early, you know, they peak too early. So this hopefully will help you to prepare. Okay, so April is really spiritual spring cleaning to find these new leadership energies 
and then coming into big interpersonal, transpersonal community activations. Everyone has a divine spark somewhere in their chart and it's the ability to think bigger and to utilize the CD energy and new healing insights are likely to seed. Okay, I'm just checking the time. I can't even see the time, but okay. Well, I know it's not exactly wrong. Let's see. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm just gonna really do baby dance around days. I don't wanna confuse you too much, but I, I, I've really spoken about a lot of these energies, but you see the correlation to other things I've spoken about. We always have the energies of Rahu and Ketu, the karmic nodes. Rahu is more futuristic, Ketu is more past life, karmic. So we often think we, we've got an understanding of something, but then we're going to get a new, more spiritual understanding of it for these times during the influence of that time. And the next chapters that those are in help us to get a real sense. It's not only in an astrological sign, but it's also got a next chapter around it. So I really look at these. And I did do a transmission about this in October, so I'm not going to go too deeply into this. Currently, we've got... K2 in Libra in Swati and Aries, uh, Rahu in Bairani in Aries. And so <coughs> Bairani is, it's again, it's like a uh, strong life, death, rebirth energy. And it's sign, it's symbol is a vulva. Yeah. So, but what's interesting about Bairani, which people often overlook, is actually called the star of restraint. So it's saying that violent cycles occur in life that we're always going through life and death and things like this. And you know, that even birth itself, it's quite painful, it's full on. But they, they liken it to, you know, if you've got four naughty little toddlers around you and you don't smack them, you know, it's about learning to have restraint around these around challenging situations. So it's a very much a motto for now. It's like really learning to cultivate and hold with the energies. Um, you're using the vulva correctly, you know, holding things on, using the mulavanda, things like that. So this is a bit of a motif for now, is really learning to work with those energies. Swati has a lot of energy around independence and quite materialistic. And so K2 is there, and, and sometimes K2 will take on Mars's energy, and this is sitting in Libra. It's also eradicating some of Libra's energy, which is about diplomacy, and uh, and things like that. So some people are saying that Swati being in uh, in Libra is making it very hard for diplomacy and peacekeeping and things like that. It has links to uh, travel and things like that. And so this energy with Swati is going to finish in July as well, when the divine spark is ending. And there's this whole sense that I think that people are learning. If we have austerity economically, one of the beauties of that is that people were, are going to have to collaborate more, which is totally Aquarian age. The Aquarian age is less about vertical organizing and more about societies and working beyond normal hier hierarchies and institutions. So one of the functions of Swati being in Ketu may be that our sense of individualism has to take some knocks. So again, these people who are really in the, oh, look at me, I'm a singular unit and I'm the queen of the universe and I'm the master of everything, that could well go through some challenges, but ultimately but there will be the spiritual component to help them to really see, can they thrive as an individual or do they need to seek collaboration? So I do think that one of the gifts out of that Swati period is going to be that people will, um, if those who take the karmic lesson anyway will learn that this is one of these beautiful things about Aquarius is knowing our sense of self and our gifts. And when I mean, Aquarians are quite independent, but they also know how to work with kind of avant-garde novel scenarios to create better structured societies. Okay. We've talked about Atrini, but basically when Swati leaves, um, when Swati leaves, blah, 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 but Swati is still in Aries, but when Swati finishes, it goes into Chitra. Now, this is also a mirror to what's going on with the other bits of information we saw. Chitra is, it, it's, it's quite about beauty and it's very creative, but it's very much about, it, it's very inventive. It, if we were to look at a nakshatra that's the inventor, it's the one that's creating new 
cult new, new ideas and new innovative approaches. So Kate is coming in with a sense of nonchalance about, about that, but it's going to be cosmically receiving this new innovative way of looking. It's going to be in Chitra for quite a while. So we again have another cosmic allusion to this awakening of certain new ideas, okay? And then Rahu is going to later in the year go into Revati, which I spoke of Revati earlier. It's, it's very much this, this wealthy seed sowing energy. Um, and so, you know, there is a sense of spiritual wealth and things like that being on the cards for people, especially depending on where it is in your chart and, and, and drive towards that. Okay, so, um, so that's going to be interesting to see how that all unfolds. These are the eclipse dates to look out for. So a lot of people are saying that October is going to, you know, the later part of the year could be quite heavy and we do have an eclipse season there. Um, so, so yeah, so these, these will be dates to all look at. April the 20th, May the 5th, October the 14th and October the 28th. Okay, final insights for the year. Um, yeah, so around June solstice, again, very lined up with all the times, Jupiter's going into Bairani as well. So, but the, Rahu goes backwards. So Rahu's gonna go in backwards into, from, from Aries into Pisces, Jupiter's going the other way. So Jupiter from solstice is going to have this vulva energy, but again, we need the restraint. So again, we have this opportunity to birth new things in and to bring through new growth and things like that. So again, it's all correlating with all this systemic change, this energetic change that we see through Aquarius, Saturn Aquarius and Pluto Aquarius. So yeah, so, so you can, and it does mean that some people will expand. I mean, Bairani people can be people who work a lot with sexuality and things like that. It does have that. Um, and hopefully this will help people to expand into true sexuality rather than the wonky sort of neo-tantra, that energy that's become a little bit contaminated, okay? Um, it's July that K2 goes into Chitra, so I mentioned the Chitra. And then, as we said earlier, we have a new galactic year coming on the 26th of July. We also have what they call the day out of time on the 25th. And so that's when we enter this white overtone wizard. So there's this receptivity that's growing, but that we have to work at. Saturn's gonna go retrograde on the 14th of October. Now, I wanna give you a little heads up here. It's in its last visit to Danishta. And Danishta is called the Star of Symphony. It's very much about getting the timing right with stuff. Danishta energy brings success and fame. And we've been dancing in and out of Danishta. It is written that Danishta, Danishta can be the one key school orchestra, which didn't practice enough, and it's playing twinkle, twinkle, out, little star really out of tune. Or it can be the symphony orchestra who just have this exquisite timing. It's all about getting the timing right. The key to Danishta is to prototype. We're in Danishta right now, okay? And there's a sense of, working on prototypes, piloting, so that when you unveil, you know, you know how proper musicians practice ours every day. And it's about this practicing and then unveiling. So we have this really beautiful little kiss for about six weeks from 14th of October to 27th of November. So this is, I feel, how you harness this divine spark because uh, you, don't want to, you don't want to launch a Rahu deluded project you can really use this final kiss of Danishta to unveil stuff, okay? And in, a lot of people will have felt, oh, I've had this thing that's on the back burner, I've been working on it, it's nearly ready to go. And you might be working quite a lot behind the scenes now. So you have a little bit of launch time now, but you've seen the rest of the astrology, it's not quite kickoff time. As I say, we are in between actual eclipse times in October, so it could be challenging too. But what I'm trying to explain to you is that you have a bit of a liftoff time that can be quite good, and you have a liftoff time again in October where prototypes can be received very well, especially if you've been really studious. You can really create a lot of, um, I would say, momentum by utilizing that six week period because it's prone to success, especially if you did the work behind the scene, okay? 
So that's another little kiss. And what's really interesting is just a, few, a week after we've gone into Dhanushka, we do get another galactic spin. So we get into the next gestation of 260 days. So we're in Dhanushka now. And so you can be really looking at something and it will go up an octave by the next galactic spin, okay? So it can be really useful for you. Don't, don't beat yourself up if you're like, thought I'd be ready to go with something because Denisha's done its third time. I think it's third time or fourth time. I can't remember, it's three or four it's gone in, but that's the end of it then, okay? And then uh, and then we have Rahu then right, right at the end of the year and at uh, the 1st of December, Oh, sorry, I should go back to uh, Shatabishak. Saturn's going back then, it goes, well, it goes forward actually into Shatabishak, back into that starry light worker, physician, slightly hermit energy, right? Uh, and we're going to do probably another phase of our non-dual astrology symposium, uh, the next batch of that, probably during that period, okay? And then Rahu's going to go into Revati with this kind of wealthy energy. Okay, and so it does mean that if you launch something in Danishta, Rahu could give you the drive to actually create, you know, wealth from that, okay? Especially depending on where it's sitting in your personal chart. Okay, so that's a little transmission over. I did manage not to go on too much. Uh, I know it's a lot of information. And uh, yeah, while I'm here, I just want to give gratitude to all the beings and to yourselves for being here, just in case we cut off the call and I didn't do that. So I just really want to give gratitude to all the timekeepers and celestial bodies and Rishis. Um, does anybody have any questions or anything they'd like to share? I know it's quite a long session. Um, yeah, Victoria, hello. Hey. Hello. Um, I wondered if you've come across uh, Cherry Clow. Sorry? No, I don't think so. Cherry clow, no? I, I can answer that. Yeah. It's a Kuiper belt object. So it's, um, again, bringing in that quantum energy. Cool. There you go. So, yes. So th this is this thing. We've got this. Is it more connected to the asteroid belts and things? Yeah, it's, uh, I believe, uh, Chrissy, it's the largest asteroid. It's got five rings and it was discovered in 1997, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's again bringing in that like quantum healing energy, like almost from nothing kind of creation. Um, just in general, right now we actually have a lot of the asteroid belt, Kuiper belt objects, moving into other signs. So with and they have very long orbits. So just new energy, new creation abilities in general coming in. Yeah, thank you. You see, so what we're gonna do so that you know, is, is in November-ish, we're going to now do the weaving between Vedic and uh, tropical astrology because there's so much in there, you know. In, in Western astrology, tropical astrology, you have the asteroids, you know, and this is newer data. And, you know, it's the first time we had things like the goddess asteroids and things like that. So it speaks a lot more to our contemporary setting. But then in Vedic astrology, we've got the soul information that sits there with the nakshatras. You know, so there's, there, there are these wings of astrology that are conventionally not talked about that much, that have so much meaning for us. And this is this whole thing. We want to educate people more on those so that they can do the close reading between these because it's phenomenal, you know, how we're, we're seeing this from different vantage points, but it's all bringing us to the same place, you know? And this is what non-duality is about. It's about not being like, you're crap because you're following the system and that's all made up because I believe they're all true. And this is coming out of duality and out of the lower chakras and coming into this expanded state of being is if, if we can go, reality is more than one narrative. Imagine what we're doing to our energetic being to come out of just being polarized and in the subject object. You see, in order to be higher spiritual beings, we have to not be so programmed into conceptual duality as our state of being. We will reach higher, higher spiritual states if we're operating from the higher chakras and able to see multiple sources of truth and to operate within all of them and dance within all of them if seamlessly. So, you know, it's just amazing that all these informations are coming together at this time. Yeah. Anyway, does anybody have another question? I did have one question. Um... Uh, about the um, glyphs on your first page, um, it's a symbol on the 
Mayan um, symbols for for um, you know the galactic star signs. Um, there's the one that is like a it looks like a sun that has many quite a few dots around it, or like a ball with quite a few dots around it. It's always like in the corner. Does that make sense? Was it you the one in the corner of my screen? In the corner of your screen. Yeah, um, what are you asking about the sign? Yeah, whether you know what what that particular bit mean meaning is is it does it mean planet and planets orbiting around or does it or um, does it mean I don't work with the signs in that sort of metaphysical way because I've not been taught how to decode Mayan hieroglyphs. So, you mm. know, we, we learn them in a, a certain way that works for us because um, what I want to say is that I've looked at the glyphs as they represent three different Mayan places and you will see sometimes glyphs that they have general um, similarities and some will look more like planets. Uh, some of them do look quite tangibly like sky or planets. And then sometimes you'll see another version of the glyph and that bit's not present. So um, you can even look online, you can look up a sign and you can see that they're, sometimes they're represented in slightly different ways. So I just have my way of, of knowing that's that glyph and that's how that sign works. But in terms of the symbology and what the Mayans meant and what they were representing, sometimes it's a little bit arbitrary for our way of seeing. So I don't work at that, with it that way. But if you want to look into it more, you can look up Google Images and look up the hieroglyph for particular signs and you'll see some have more um galactic looking representations and some of them don't some of them omit the bit that may talk to the stars okay yeah yeah no thank and you also look at things like the dresden codex which includes quite a lot of the signs it's one of the only surviving mayan codexes so that would be one of the root um manuscripts i can send you a copy of that if you ever want to see it yeah Oh, wow. Okay, thank you. Cool. And yeah, we're, we're hoping to have some of the main Mayan astrologers on to share about the systems. Um, we've already got some amazing people confirmed. And uh, yeah, so I do want to just mention that the, uh, the Non-Dual Astrology Symposium is going to be on the 1st and the 8th of April. And as I said, we're going to be bringing on day keepers and very, very wise, wide, widely educated uh, keepers of these systems from both systems. And then we're going to be putting them in panels together. And that's, um, it's never happened as far as we're aware. And people are starting to come to us to say, what are we going to do about this fighting? We're like, we're, we're going to talk to you very soon. So, so yeah, so we want to bring people on to bring in that co-inquiry with the people who are way more experienced. I'm a weaver and that's very much in my sign. But so I'm a bit of a multitasker. There are people who are so much more knowledgeable than me about the nuances. So if you have questions, you ask them to them. I, I see, I th I'm a pattern thinker, okay? So I work with the weaving, but in terms of finite knowledge and the people who are very, very studious in this, you know, these people are the ones to talk to in April, all right? And if you are interested, I'll be doing a transmission. As I say, I can't remember what date in February, but um, Madalena probably knows. Um, uh, or oh, something like the third, I don't know anymore. Um, so I think she's written it in the chat box. So basically, yeah, we're gonna have that for the 10 years. If you wanna have a bit of a thing about feeling the dancing for the next 10 years to try to also realize the work in progress that we're in. You see, I think the Western world, we consistently think, oh, I'm messing up. You know, I thought I was gonna have this super productive year. And I ended up like having an existential crisis and, uh, you know, finding a new partner and everything went out the window, blah, blah, blah. And, and actually, when you see time and go, I've got time, you know, that's what it wants us to know. We can really feel that we're here to, 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 to dance into this. And yeah, I hope it will be useful for you all. Does anybody have a final question? Or anything they'd like to say? Whoops. Stop share. Just um, a reflection back. The Saturn retrograde in October really landed with me with the prototyping energy of where we are right now. It's like 
I like, okay, this it's not go time yet, but it's not, you're not doing any work. You're, you're preparing it and you're so just like, yeah, that, that like cycled back to the beginning of the energy. Yeah, I saw you having your aha. Um, and yeah, it's just really helpful when we know, oh, I've got a bit more time because sometimes this is it. We think, oh, I missed my moment. It's like, no, 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 there's another little window. So so yeah, so it'd be really great. And then obviously you can also use this new galactic spin to just be looking at the energies as, as they're rolling, you know, where it's all lining up, which is really great. So you've got a little bit of lead in time before the galactic spin, you know, like two or three weeks. So we, you can really especially because you're an astrologer you can look at you can kind of map it and get almost very finite with the dates it's it's really amazing yeah um yeah so madeline has written february 9th 6 p.m cool yeah so um christine you wrote something but i don't i channel so if it, if it didn't get dealt with it didn't get dealt with so um yeah um, I think we'll leave it because then we've actually finished at exactly the time we said we would. Uh, sorry that I was the one doing all the talking today. I really hope this is useful for you for this year. Um, and, and do play it back, take notes, look at the pictures, look things up. Because as I say, I've done a limited reading on each one so that I didn't go on and on forever. Yeah. But I really, really hope this helps you to get the most out of this magical year and that we can be... The, the ones, you know, holding the center and knowing that we're going somewhere because a lot of people will, will not. So I'm really honoring you for showing up and honoring that we are a little collective weaving with this. And so lovely to see you. Uh, yeah, take care, everybody. And thank you, thank you, thank you to you all, to your higher selves, and one and avatar selves. And thank you to the lands of Mexico, the Pleiades Rocks, Zero Point. Gracias, gracias, gracias. Ciao, ciao.